I want to thank the organizers for this kind invitation and I want to congratulate you. You really did an amazing job with organizing this. The equality of men and women, human rights, women rights. We have come a long way, but there's still some way to go, especially the so-called Western civilizations may have achieved something. And if we look at men and women, there's really no difference. We are similar. We are equal. Now, it may seem strange to you that an anatomist would talk about important sociological and political issues. Well, it's actually with some pride that I can tell you that in years of research, we were able to discover anatomical differences between men and women, and these differences concern the brain. There are indeed functional differences and structural differences. If you look at the brain, from the outside, it seems to be similar in males and females. However, in terms of function, there are some differences. Just to give you one example, the brain is the most important control organ for endocrine glands. And for instance, the secretion of gonadotropins is in females cyclic, as you know, and in men tonic. So this is controlled in the brain, and this is maybe one of the functional differences. But there are also structural differences. Um, the male brain has about 1,500 grams of weight, the female brain about 1,250 grams. Now, in order to be scientifically correct, of course, you have to calculate this by the body weight, which ends up that the female brain is about 10 to 15 percent larger than the male brain. But as we all know, size doesn't matter. Of course, in, in most instances, there's some exceptions. There's a way to define intelligence in terms of neuroscience, neuroanatomy, and that's the number of connections between the brain, between the different parts of the brain. The connectivity within the brain, the white matter, is in females much larger than in males. You can really tell by the, by just by a CT or MRI image, this is a male or a female brain. And then there are certain portions, they are called nuclei, the sexual dimorphic, the dimorphic nuclei, which is larger in males, and this, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that is larger in females. So there are indeed structural differences in addition to the functional differences. It was a few years ago that it was discovered that homosexuals have, to some extent, the phenotype of the brain and be of the other gender, which, of course, was an uproar in, the, in science, because if you just think about it, that you could attribute things like lifestyle with structural changes in the brain, that's really a scary thought. But this is something that was observed. Now, how does a male and a female brain develop? Well, the development occurs already in the fetal period. And what happens is that neurons start to divide and migrate. And they have a certain time to form a functional network. And they form a network by building synapses, by building connections within each other. And they have only a certain time to do so. If they don't manage to reach uh, connectivity, they will die. And 95% of all nerve cells that develop in our brain will die before they manage to form a connective network to form synapses. This is a large magnification drawing of one of these interconnectivities of the different nerve cells with each other. The control of this synapse formation is in part modulated by hormones, by hormones of the gonads. And there's one hormone that's estrogen, or estrogens, estradiol, the female sex hormone that enters the brain and that sort of inhibits selectively the formation of synapses. 
So the female hormone would induce the generation of a male brain. Yeah? It's the female sex hormone that makes man's brain shrivel up. Yeah? That would happen to any infant, to any fetus, because the maternal circulation contains huge amounts of estrogen. And in order to prevent this, the fetus develops a special protein. It's called alpha feed protein, which binds all estrogens. So the normal, the, the female brain would be protected by this estrogen binding protein, it would be naive. Only in boys, in male fetuses, gonads are developed in the last trimester of pregnancy and they build testosterone which enters into the brain, into the nerve cells, and there's an enzyme called aromatase which transforms testosterone into estradiol to facilitate the generation of a male brain. So it's the female sex hormone that makes a male brain. However, the smaller male brain, women are to, not to blame for it. It's our very own testosterone that goes into our brains and it's transformed into the female hormone to make the male brain. Now this gentleman is something that should make us think. Of course, within the frames of our abilities, this is. The brain is an important endocrine organ. It's a gland. It produces hormones. And one of these hormones is oxytocin. It was referred to as the love hormone. It's made in nerve cells, and it's secreted into the pituitary to induce milk ejection during lactation or uterus contraction during parturition. And it also uh, induces seminal emissions and erections in men. So it's one of these big hormones that uh, is in, uh, involved in reproduction. These nerve cells have collaterals within the brain to the limbic system, the system that's important for emotions. And of course, the expression and the secretion of these hormones of oxytocin, of the love hormone, is controlled by estrogen. And the connections within the limbic systems induce sexual behavior and maternal behavior. And you can do this, show this in experimental animals. Um, this is actually known that the connection between the steroid hormones and the love hormone, it is, it's well known. There's uh, this very old copper engraving, which I found from 1619 from a gentleman, Mr. Corbius, who traveled to, through Africa. And you observed the Hottentots had a very interesting way of obtaining milk. One would stimulate the cow in the rear, and the other would just put underneath a bucket to collect the milk, and the cow didn't seem to oppose too much to this. And it was in the 50s that this connection between milk ejection and gonadal stimulation, genital uh, stimulation, would enter the literature as Ferguson reflex. Now we know that sex hormones stimulate oxytocin, and if you look at the uh, red brain and, uh, and look at the red that had been injected with estrogen, you see that the nerve cells, uh, drawn here red, that uh, produce oxytocin are increased in number. And the, this only works with a very little amount of estrogen and high amounts of estrogen would downregulate it. And you observe the very same effect in males during mating. If you have a big, mean old rat, and male rat, and you put a newborn pups in the cage, the rat will think it's food and will just eat them. And if you inject these rats before you put in the pups with oxytocin, they will build a nest and will be very really sweet to the uh, pups and will not, uh, do, uh, will not harm them. And the very same thing happens when you let the rat mate. During mating, the, uh, with initial mating, the oxytocin pools are depleted. If they are allowed to meet for a long time, have long sexual experience, the oxytocin system is upregulated and it stays that way. Um, there's a kind of male central virginity. The oxytocin system is activated. It, re it reaches the female status. And interestingly, the sexual and maternal behavior 
in males is controlled in the limbic system by the very same circuits. Now, in terms of biology, this makes sense that a species that has a complicated cyclus of reproduction will recruit both genders into raising the litter. That's important for survival. I mean, these are observations made in animals. Sexual and maternal behavior is linked in men, How, uh, in, in, in male rats. And you cannot uh, conclude from animal observations to humans. However, this is tempting. If, for instance, in male humans, sexual and maternal behavior would be controlled by the same circuits, would be linked. Perhaps this is the reason why a man calls a woman he loves baby. It's, in my opinion, one of the most fundamental misunderstandings between the gender. I mean, who, which grown woman wants ever, when she's in her right mind, be treated like an infant. Oh, baby, I'm so much in love with you. What? What did you just call me? Frank, I never understood why women would put up with this. Ladies, it's brain circuits. It's sorted into our system. There's nothing we can do about it. We can't help it, I'm sorry. In females, sexual and maternal behavior exclude each other. When a female is maternal, taking care of a litter, she will attack the male and chase it away. And after the litter is weaned, she will again become sexually active and mate again. Again, in terms of biology, this makes sense. That a species that needs to ensure, like any species, the survival Males will be chased away until the offspring is weaned and is able to survive. Again, you cannot conclude to human behavior, however it is tempting. And maybe this is one of the reasons why mood of women changes rather than once they have children. And once they have little children, they are only maternal. And they start to treat their spouse as one of their children. Not that they may not deserve it. Honey, before you come to them, please put off your shoes and wash your hands. And he says, sweetie, you are getting more and more like your mother. There's sex differences in perception and cognition, especially if it comes to sexual arousal. And in men, senses that, directed to, that are directed towards distance, like vision or acoustics, are uh, the main ports of entry for arousal. I don't know any woman who would appreciate telephone sex. Yeah? However, I mean, Frank uh, is, on, is on, a, on a phone for you. You probably wouldn't like this too much. But men apparently do. And the industry, of course, knows this. In women, arousal stimulation is more directed or more controlled by senses that are for the close, uh, this, for the close, uh, uh, for closest, like uh, olfactory perception, gustatory perception, or tactile perception. And of course, the, uh, the cosmetic industry knows this. Speech, speech is definitely an invention of the female gender. Men would have never come up with this. The brain is an endocrine organ, and also the stress response, the way we respond to stress is gender-specific. It's different. And men tend to even get addicted to stress. Stress and addiction are the same neuronal, similar neuronal circuits. Only men do these crazy things. And it has always been that way. That's why probably wars are always conducted by men. And even in the old age, look at Siegfried the Dragon Slayer, yeah? He just went into the forest to kill this dragon because he wanted to have this kick in his brain, yeah? Animal rights didn't bother him at all, yeah? 
but it was the, the last species, he just killed it because he wanted to have this feeling, he wanted to have this stress. A, a little Ritalin would have taken care of his problem, you know? And that's of course has been around forever. I'm sure that the mammoth was extinct because our forefather wanted to have some fun. Now, stress and addiction are closely linked and men are capable of getting addicted to everything. Getting addicted to sex, to game, to food, to smoking, to drugs, to fast cars, just everything. Addiction and is perhaps the male way of stress response, response to chronic stress. In females, it's quite different. Chronic stress quite frequently results in depression, and depression is to 80% a female symptom. And I guess depression is also some kind of an addiction, and the same is true for anorexia, which is in most cases a female ailment. Hyperactivity in children is mostly affecting boys, or the uh, attention deficit disorder or the aggression disease. It's an ailment of the male gender. So these behavioral things are quite different. And the ideal of beauty, beauty is something that's imprinted in our brains. And it's sex reverse. A woman wants to be beautiful the way she would like to have a man. She wants to be skinny, she wants to be slender, and that's why she starves herself to death almost. And men see this quite differently. Men want to be beautiful, to be round, because they want to have the female phenotype in their brain. I'm sure that the huge, huge pectoral muscle that the bodybuilders gain should resemble breasts, because they still have the Stone Age Venus of Willendorf in their head. So the images are different, and of course the yeah, commercial industry knows this. I mean, uh, what does liquor have to do with a beautiful woman? It's intended for men. The man sees liquor, beautiful woman, bite. Yeah? <laughs> the same true for uh, in car tires. Is there anything less romantic on this planet than automotive tires, right? So there's a woman to advertise this, or insurances. So summarizing the differences between the gender have been all the time around. That's what the attraction makes out. Uh, if you look at the uh, paintings in Pompeii, at uh, the uh, Tantra or, or Casanova, it has been always around. Now, I guess my talk has become sort of philosophical and has left anatomy. And for a philosophical talk, you have to stop with a definition. And my definition is sexuality is the biological concept of distinction. The fact that we are different is the basis of our att attractivity. That's what makes us attractive. And that's what we should keep in mind even if we strive for equality. Thank you very much.